Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome back to Paragon Bootcamp 2021. It is time to move away from the uh, the melee magic and missile, and we're going to talk about uh, something a little bit different. Now we're talking about teamwork. And here to present a lecture about that topic, he is from the Nine Blades, he is a Paragon Barbarian, he is a Paragon Warrior, and he is a member of the undefeated Phoenix League team, the Canuck Shucks. Please give it up for Upper Classman Jeet. Hello, everybody. I uh, just want to say thank you to the uh, Krat team for having me on for this. I always enjoy putting on lectures um, and seminars, so... <laughs> Um, it's a great excuse for me to come out and spew whatever I think is necessary. Um, there, my notes have been posted around various things. I'm going to post them up in the chat right now, and I'm going to throw them up every once in a while um, for what I'm talking about. These are the notes that I'm going to be reading off of, so you should be following along um, there if you want. Um, and this, I want this to be somewhat interactive. Uh, if, if necessary, so if you have questions, please put them in the chat. I'm watching down there. Um, they're right next to my notes, so they are within eyeshot. Um, so yeah, today... Oh yeah, uh, just a brief disclaimer. Um, this lecture that I'm... or broadcast that I'm doing about teamwork and how to make the dream work, um, it's not the be-all and end-all. I've just done this from... This is just stuff that I've gathered over... Um, I guess 28 years of playing team sports and um, organizing logistics in my professional career and also doing some minor research on the side. Um, so don't take anything as the be all end all. There is plenty of stuff that I do get wrong on a regular basis. So um, do your own research into things and uh, we'll see what you come up with. And with that said, I'm always happy to talk about uh, stuff like this and chop shop. So uh, when we get together, uh, again, feel free. We can talk uh, theory crafting and theories and all that other stuff. Um, so today, on the on the agenda, um, we're going to be talking about teamwork. Briefly talking about teamwork and pop culture and what people are viewing as teamwork on a regular basis. Um, what's at the core of teamwork? Pattern recognition um making calls and reacting to calls and also how to participate as a team in a big big event um if there's time we're going to go into a role cohesion um but that's kind of a different topic so we're going to leave that um just if we need to run into it at the end depending on how fast i talk um so yeah we can get into it so um teamwork and pop culture a lot of people so just because people don't research teamwork doesn't mean that they don't see it on a regular basis. Um, obviously, sports is a big, big part of teamwork and pop culture. But when people go to the movies or read comics or play video games, they also get a view of what teamwork is. And in those fantasy settings, and I include sci-fi and that, and so pretty much movies, comics, um, movies, comments, and video games, a lot of that is really just small groups or small packets of individualism succeeding, right? So they're not, they don't do connected fighting or connected victories. Um, it's more so for spectacle, and it works that way because it shows the individual coming up and beating a whole bunch of henchmen right and then it's a team of individuals beating up henchmen and leaving them on rooftops and then not killing anyone saying that they're the good guy um so and you also like and also the baddies in those shows are very very narcissistic and individual themselves so they don't care about and a lot of times you see them sacrificing teammates which is not a good part of teamwork um so if you're watching and, and um, consuming media, be cognizant that what you're seeing isn't really a good idea of teamwork. It's more fantasy and heroism that they're showing you for spectacle, 
right? Now, there are some good examples um, in pop culture, and now there's going to be spoilers for um, the first Avengers movie that came out and also the Mandalorian season two. So um, a good example of teamwork is the first Avengers in the final battle. Um, Cap, Captain America is making all the calls. He is directing on who to go where. They go to their assignment and they're taking care of their assignment in how they deem necessary and most efficient and have the best outcome. Right. So Captain America isn't micromanaging, telling Tony where to shoot the missiles. He's just saying, Tony, go take care of Fifth Avenue. Right. And he literally just says, Hulk smash. And he just lets Hulk off the leash and just go nuts. Right. Um, and you see that not only are they doing that, but then the people themselves are also communicating. You have Tony Stark calling out and saying, I got a group coming down. Um, I don't know. First Avenue. I don't, I don't know what New York's how they work out. Um, and so you have them communicating and keeping those lines open so that they can build off of each other. Tony is baiting people in, kiting, if you will, the enemy into a death trap where someone's going to take advantage of that, right? Um, another example of small team tactics is the Night Owls in The Mandalorian. Those are the ones with the blue armor. Um, I forget what the person's name, but the, uh, they were also in Clone Wars, and I, yeah, I think just Clone Wars. Um, and they're when they they're the first Mandalorians that Din comes in contact with, um, that isn't part of his own sect. Um, if you're watching when they're storming the um, the ships that they take over, they are moving and weaving in between each other. And also when they're using their grapples and their melee, they're setting each other up. They're making sure the other person has space. If you watch, they turn the enemies away. And then oh, a really great example is when they grapple hook someone, pull them in, and the other one flies over and either knees or elbows the person in the face. It's, it's fantastic. And then you see that contrasted to Din coming in as the lone gunman. And he's amazed. He knows that he's good. He's amazed by them. He's keeping up, but he's looking around, realizing that, like, they just laid waste to this corridor. And so you watch them, and they're weaving in, covering each other's sides, and supporting each other, right? And if you want to break it down, you can pause it in slow-mo and all that jazz, but you really just get a sense of flow, and that comes from years of teamwork, where there's no verbal communication. It's just feeling your allies and moving with them and knowing that you have a role that your people are relying on you to carry out. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just things to keep in mind when you're watching in pop culture, because that is usually people's first point of research is seeing it in entertainment. Um, but yeah, let's move on to what's at the core of teamwork. So at the core of teamwork, there is trust. Trust is everything in teamwork. If you don't have it, you have nothing. If you have people that don't trust each other and trusting can come in various levels, you can trust someone to do the job, you can trust someone personally, right? But it's making sure that you have some level of trust when you're going through and trying to build up a team and trying to develop team. Now, um, there are various ways to see how trust works. You can either look at it as kind of a, um, a social monetary value where you make deposits into a relationship and then you make withdrawals from a relationship. Or you can look at it like um, uh, a plant um, or something uh, biological where it, it, it has to be seeded, it needs to be nurtured, it can be grown, um, it might decay, it might welt, uh, it might be left to fallow, right? And you, you need to, in both regards, you need to put the time into it. So whatever metaphor that you come up with yourself um, you need to make sure that you are putting the time in for teamwork. Now, a lot of this can happen in game, but for real teamwork to, to happen, it needs to show up out of game as well, because as much as we say that we're a LARP, right? Everyone always has a little bit of their person of who they are in the characters that they play. I have yet to see someone who is selfish, a jerk, 
brutish, all that stuff, and play a really em empathetic and friendly character, right? So, um, how to seed, um, how to seed trust in people? It's literally just being nice and polite, right? It's super easy to just get that, like, get your foot in, get that, just get the seed in the ground so it can start growing. Um, it's just being nice, just saying, hey, how's it going? Like taking an interest in them, right? Um, and a great way to start it is by volunteering and following through on what you are volunteering for. It could be a small thing as just you're cleaning up chairs, right? It could be teaching a class. As long as you are following through with what you are volunteering for, you are starting the layers of trust between you and the people and also people viewing you and hearing, oh, I hear that person does this. Oh, they volunteered at that, right? You're already getting this foundation of layer uh, of trust amongst people. The more you volunteer and the more you help out, the kinder you are, the politer you are. Um, now, with volunteering, I said that following through is a big part and you have to make sure that you don't bite off too much than what you are capable of. And that means physically, mentally, time-wise, right? And when you, if you do realize that you have been up too much, that you were a little too ambitious, that's fine, that happens, right? A mistake was made and you need to make sure that it's covered. So as soon as you realize that you're bit off too much, you need to let the person know that you bit off too much, right? And there's a, there's a difference between being nervous and knowing that you're biting off too much and that comes with experience. So it's volunteering is a skill. You need to know your time management, your knowledge, all in the subject, all that stuff. So when you realize that you bit off too much, you go to the person who's organizing and be like, listen, I think I was a little too ambitious. Maybe it could be your nerves and then hopefully they can talk you down. Maybe they can point you to someone who can talk you down or maybe they can point you to someone who can help or they can say, okay, we're gonna change it up a bit. Here's what we're doing, right? You need to make sure that those lines of communication are open and you're being honest with the person that you're volunteering with or to, right? And that's it. You are building trust. This person trusted you to do something and you trust them with the knowledge that you are uneasy or unsure about what your performance is going to be, right? Um, so going on with how to like seed and grow. So how to nurture trust is literally sharing your interests and actively listening with people when you're volunteering when you're working with them that's not and also just when you're hanging out by a fire or you're just talking to them on facebook anything right so like and then also like in game you can practice these things sharing interests just as in like what comic or what movie or what game or what sports team you like like that's all great for out of game and finding out who they are and what they like. And it also gives you a sense of how, like who they are and what they like. So, you know, um, how they are going to react. You're building up kind of, we're going to get in this later, kind of a profile of someone. Right. So like this can work in game because you ask for their input. So when you're sharing your interests in game, you're sharing what interests you about the battle game and what objectives you want to take, what objectives they want to take, how they like to enjoy the game. Some people just like to enjoy Empire just for fighting and killing. That's fine. Those people can just be your rabid, your rabid dogs that you just let off the leash. You don't count on them for taking objectives. You count on them for disrupting the team. That's part of teamwork, right? Um, so in game, you want to find out what they like about the battle game, what they're interested in doing within the battle game, and also amp guard as a whole. Um, and you also want to ask for input and in actively listening for what ideas they have, because there are different people have different levels of experience and also different tactical senses, but no one has all the ideas and all and all the right ones, right? So you want different input so you can take that in, consume it and then formulate your own plan, right? A lot of times I have no idea what I want to do, so I just listen out for what people want to do and I try and fit into their plan, right? Um, so you want to find out like what role they want to play. Sometimes they just want to be a defender. 
Sometimes they want to be an aggro, sometimes DPS, healer, right, or support, I guess. And then you want to support what they what they want to do. Um, right, sorry, I just saw a bunch of messages pop up. Um, so you want to support what they want to do, or you want to try and take their ideas and fit them into your plan. So if someone wants to go and fight a lot, don't make them stand at base because if I wanted to fight a lot and you're like, no, your job is to stand at the base and defend, unless there's a lot of action at base, I'm just going to leave because face it, it's amp card and you're not the boss of me, right? Like if amp card is supposed to be fun for everybody, not just for your victory, right? If you want to yell at me for leaving my post, I'm probably going to yell at you back and it's just a make-believe game. So make sure everyone is enjoying and doing something that they like. Also, halfway through the battle game, that can change depending on how long it is. Even if it's a 30-minute battle game, that can change. Someone might want to go and fight and then they might want to defend. They might want to go after different objectives, right? So try and fit that in your plan. If someone says, listen, I don't want to do this anymore, they're trusting you with that information. Accept that trust and give it back by saying, okay, I see you, I hear you, we're going to take your wants and your needs and we're going to manipulate the plan outside of it, right? And go along. Um, so, like, you want, like, you want the ultimate call to be their own so that they are trusting in the plan. If you're barking orders at people, right? and you're not taking any of their input and you're just brushing them off, chances are they're not going to follow up with your plan because why should they, right? You want them to be a part of the plan. So it is their plan. So it is all of your, like everyone who is participating, it's all your plan, right? Or plan no. And that's how you get buy-in from the people. Um, how you continue to grow the trust, not just nurture it, but you grow it is that, you don't blame people for when the plan falls apart. There, sometimes someone can just screw up, right? They screw up or they actively make a choice, right? To not fulfill their portion of the plan. You can go and yell at them and say, okay, they're no longer part of the plan. Forget it, right? That is an option, but a better option is, is to ask what assistance they need or where they want to go. So if someone is not standing at their post and guarding a door, you ask them, okay, are, are you being pressured? If they go, no, I'm just not feeling, I don't want to defend. Be like, okay, that's fine. You go over there. We're going to get another defender. Right. And that's all you need to do. You want to make sure that people fulfill certain roles. And sometimes if there's no one fulfilling a role, that needs to be filled. Sometimes if you want to be a leader, then that's your job to fulfill the empty spot because you are supporting your team, right? You're the leader is not the person that is telling everyone what to do and watching the gears come through and tacking maniacally, right? That's a villain, right? If you want to be a leader of a team, you find out what spots need to be filled and you support those areas right? If all the areas are filled, then yes, you get to go and you get to do whatever you want or whatever plan it is that you have, right? But if there is a shortcoming and you want to be a team leader, you fill that spot, right? Sometimes in Amcard, it's a little harder because like you can't have a barbarian that's also the support person, right? That's because they can't heal. They can't buff. They can't debuff. Right? Uh, I mean, they can't release, right? Yeah, that's hard to do. So you, you got to work within the toolbox that you have given to you, but your job as the team leader is not to force people to take roles. Your job as a team leader is to make sure it's to facilitate where people are going. That heals all. <laughs> yeah, very good. Actually, yeah, uh, Wunjo, that is some uh, V9 feedback. Um, if a barbarian kills an enemy, then they should heal back all their wounds, uh, maybe after a death count, but yeah, we should... Look into that. I, I would look into that uh, for someone. Um, so yeah, um, so that's how you grow trust. So I know I kind of sped through trust 
Um, but like, so you want to seed it by just being nice and polite to people and volunteering is a great way to build up that foundation. Um, you want to nurture it by sharing interests and actively listening. And that's sort of sharing interests outside of the game, but sharing interests inside of the game is finding out what objectives, style of play that people want to do and also actively listening by taking their input and folding it into your plan, right? And making it better because teamwork is OP, especially in V8, right? Um, and you grow trust by when someone, when, when someone fails, you don't blame them. You find out what they need to succeed and help them achieve that. Sometimes it is out of their control. Sometimes it was a choice that they made. If someone doesn't want to be part of the plan, do not make them part of your plan. They are not going to, they're going to let you down. Or most of the time, sometimes they'll, sometimes they'll become part of the plan and they'll surprise you, right? People are always surprising um, and you love to see it. But if they don't want to be part of the plan, don't count them as part of your plan. They are letting you know that they are that you should not count on them. And that's fine because it's a fun game for everyone, not just for your plans and I ideas. Um, so yeah, that's trust. Um, I got some hippy dippy and pseudoscience-y stuff that I looked into. I'm gonna save that for near the end where we can get a little crazy with our thoughts about how to build up teamwork in in a very not just as like being a nice person but in a very focused almost manufactured way right but let's move on to pattern recognition um from here so like when i put up i so teamwork is a very very general and blanketed term right there's so much that goes into teamwork it sometimes it happens naturally a lot of time it doesn't right people get frustrated with how, how someone's not being a part of the team but no one but no one asks them if they wanted to be part of the team right um and a lot of questions so like how how do you identify uh linchpins and weaknesses on your team as well as the other team right how do you hide and exploit those linchpins, right? How do you read yours and your opposing teams to make up group calls? Like all of them were kind of, all the main questions are kind of like locking in and kind of dancing around each other. And I kind of decided when I was looking at it is that this all falls under like pattern recognition. And the good thing for us is that Humans naturally look for patterns. And in fact, when there isn't a pattern, sometimes we put it, it into ourselves, right? A lot of conspiracies are based on that. Um, so like sometimes people are so, you know, the brain is always looking for patterns. That's why a lot of cars, the fronts of them are made to look like faces, to go to a certain clientele. Um, the faster your sportier cars, they're more curved, crouched, like settled in, ready to pounce, right? Because our human brains, right, when we didn't have these wonderful houses in air conditioning and all we had was fire and sharp rocks, when we saw something crouched and looking at us, that was a predator. And our we needed to build up a shortcut in our brain to be like, that's a predator, that's dangerous, that's exciting. Right. And also you have other cars that are more family friendly, right? Like SUVs and minivans. They're a little bubbly and they look like they're smiling because we want to feel comfort. We want to feel safe. That car is made to give us a safe feeling because when we're looking at other humans and they're all smiling and oh, I got a little cheeks that are bubbling up like that, little strong cheekbones, right? That makes us feel safe because we are within good company. Right. So that's why car manufacturers are making their vehicles look certain ways to get certain reactions out of people because of pattern recognition. And these are patterns that are built deep, deep into our DNA. Um, 
so that we have these shortcuts in our brains to make sure that we know what we're thinking. So how, um, how does that fall within AMP Guard? So pattern recognition um, within teams and in AMP Guard is knowing the habits of those on your team and the opposite team. And this, this comes down, this can be just general, um, general, general habits. So like one thing is that, um, for instance, um, a lot of people, when they're looking at me, they probably know that I'm probably not going to be on the defensive too much. I'm not going to hold the door a lot because that's not my style of play after COVID. It might be because I've really let myself go as everyone can see with all the hair everywhere, right? There is a very good reason why I borrowed this garb to make sure that my lower, my chin and lower, right? That's all covered because right now it's a lot more bubbly than what it used to be. And it was already pretty bubbly then, right? So I may take a more, oh yeah, it's very heavy dad bod. I have a kid now. I'm allowed to say that. That's my word, right? So, um, <laughs> what was I going after? Ah, uh, crazy. So yes, pattern recognition. Um, me. Even my defensive stuff, when I'm coming up with a defensive strategy, a lot of it is just like taunting and uh like aggro aggro sucking away from a certain thing. I'll open up a second uh uh a second line of combat just to draw off like three people. Whether I'm gonna fight them or not, I don't it's not really in that's not really what I want to do. I want to just siphon off people so that the main line doesn't want to, so the main line doesn't do it. And then I try to find another way to disrupt the line, right? That's a lot of my strategies um, when I'm fighting. And that's also because I played a lot of uh, Barbarian and Warrior. But even when I, I've been dipping into Archer and a lot of it is me coming at the sides and trying to siphon off maybe one person, right? And taking them for a jog and trying to shoot up their legs, right? So when someone's looking at me, they're like, okay, Kendall probably isn't going to stay put for very long. How can we get him out of position, right? And I, no, I'm not going to give you reasons to how or how to pull me out of position. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Chase and Mark can put those up in the chat for how to pull me out of position. Chocolate is a good way to pull me out. Um, I'll, I'll, that's a free one for everyone that showed up today. But there are other ways to get me out of position, I'm sure. I have many shortcomings, right? So you want to, you're like, Kendall's not going to stay, uh, stay put for very long. Maybe we can draw him out. Maybe we should just wear him down because he's going to get bored and then we can go in. Maybe, like, we just pick him off with an arrow when he's not looking because he gets very, he gets heavy tunnel vision on just one thing, right? Maybe we just CC him out and he'll get frustrated and score him off, right? All of these things have happened. I've been working on others. I've been working on them. So maybe they won't anymore. Who knows? You, me, catch me on field, right? Um, but yes, it's knowing the habits of those on your team and also on the other team and trying to play those. Oh, no, that's not even, no, that's just recognizing it, right? So pattern, having pattern recognition is a skill. Right. Some people have it naturally. Well, everyone has it naturally. Some people have people recognition easier than others. Right. So um, one way that I found that really helped me with my pattern recognition of people is having empathy for them. And from what I my the definition of I empathy I use is just putting myself in someone else's shoes after I've gotten to know them a little bit more and trying to understand where they're coming from in a very like out of game in game. Right. And so that lets me know on like what their thought patterns are. Do they jump to conclusions quickly? Are they shy? Why are they shy? Right. Um, will they in a fight, will they fold quickly because they're shy? Like, do I just need to be an overwhelming force at this person and that'll chase them off, right? Do I need to be sneaky with this person because they're also going to meet me with a lot of aggression, right? Um, 
having empathy and understanding why people do the things they do, right, is going to um, influence your pattern recognition and develop it, right? So you're kind of building a person profile for everyone. And this just happens naturally through when you get, when you're talking to people, this is how you develop, whether you like a person or you don't, both in a platonic or romantic sense, right? You're, when you're talking to someone, you're sharing your interests and you're really getting to know this person, right? You're building up a person profile. So since you're doing it naturally, there is, if you're able to understand, like, also you got to understand the way that you think and you look at people, right? And you got to understand your shortcomings and your strengths in that. And you build up a person profile in how they're going to behave, how they're going to act um, in an amp guard setting. And a lot of that comes from real world setting um, and how they get news, how they, how they hang out at the sidelines, right? Um, gossip happens everywhere. And if they want no part in gossip or they just delve right in, right? That means that either they they can be very interested in something or they just don't care, right? It's, um, it's a skill that everyone has and that everyone can develop. And it's just having empathy for people. Um, you also want to get others input onto how that person, and it's just, Oh, what would you think of like comes easier because now like that, when I, when I was looking out for like Paragon stuff, it became easier for me because I would look at people in a gaming sense right and i would talk to other paragons like oh what do you think of person y and they would go oh they did one two three and i say yeah yeah no that's true right um well, what do you think of this and they go oh well you know they really are working on that and so i found that that helped me build up people's amp guard profile because i would know what they're working on i would know what their shortcomings on what to look for in both uh uh a paragon sense and also just a fight uh going up against them and also a, a teammate sense right um but you want other people's views about other players because again you're you're literally just getting one snapshot of a person they have other information to bring in and i'm not talking about gossip where they oh i heard that they did this or i heard that they did that right? Gossip is like, that is tertiary information that like, you really need to scrub through to make sure that like, those are hints at what someone might be, right? You never want to take gossip as, oh, this person behaves like this, unless someone says, listen, this person is going to charge you. Oh, no, I may have lost Oh, I didn't. Still good. Still good. Sorry. I am running on a shoestring budget here. There we go. I'm back. I'm back. Okay. I'm not sure how many mulligans uh, Wunjo uh, has me, but that's one. You can count that as one. Um. So yes, you want to get other people's input, and if they're if it's just gossip, keep that in the back of your head. Those are hints at what someone might. Do right? But get other people's input on what they saw on the field or like other various things because they're going to help you build out the profile because it's someone else's outlook on that on that person. When I'm looking at someone on AmpGuard, it is a very, very competitive break them down, strengths, weaknesses, I saw them favoring their left foot or I heard that they twisted their ankle right? It's a very competitive viewpoint. And I need others input on that person. And oh, they know their spells, they don't need to run because right, because they'll just verbal you to death before you even before you even get close, right? Or other also, I need to know that if someone is injured, not to actually press that side of them, because I don't want to injure them more. I just want to use that to make sure that one they don't get hurt more and i win easier but it's very very delicate line to go down all right 
So once you have empathy, you develop empathy, you're understanding people, you're building up your own profiles for people, you're bringing in other people's views on those uh, those persons and how they function in AmpGuard, right? You need to review because the beautiful thing about people is that they will change, right? Maybe not going to become a whole different person, but people will develop um, will develop shortcomings or they will overcome shortcomings. And you want to make sure that you change the personal profile of them um, as frequently as possible. And it's not always easy, right? It's hard to overcome uh, how you view people, but especially in a very competitive, competitive sense. Like when you're playing in Phoenix League, it is a pressure cooker of amp guard that I love, right? It's, I freaking love it, it's so much fun, right? But it is a pressure cooker where things are just popping off and a round is done in maybe like, it could be done within 15 seconds. It could be six minutes, right? Um, I could be wrong about that six minutes. I forget the actual rules for how long a half or a round is, but like they could be very long. So you want to make sure that you are your snap judgments that you are making based off of your person profile, right? Those are, um, those are as correct as you are aware. For instance, I haven't seen Craigor. I haven't seen Craigor in a long, long time. Right, and I hope to see him again. Um, on the battlefield, I love fighting him. Right, mostly because he's—I'm pretty sure he's half my age, and I always make sure that I'm hip on the youth. Uh, so, but he is a very, very aggressive player, very aggressive. Right. So right now, I'm like, okay, Craigor is probably gonna push me, and push hard in Phoenix League. Right. I haven't seen him in a long time. He could have come up with. A more defensive strategy. He could fake. He he could be fully aware. But tell us, I think that I'm aggressive, and he could fake me out with it. Come in and then cut across a different way in a defensive way, defensive way, right? So I need to make sure that like I'm gonna be like, hey, has anyone seen Craig or fighting? How is he? Blah 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 blah, like all that stuff, right? And I'm gonna come up and I'll hopefully update my personal profile of him. I'm gonna see what people say, keep it on, keep it in my mind, and then see if anything gets confirmed while I'm I'm watching him do other rounds, while I'm fighting up against him, while we're ditching, all this stuff, right? It all it's all the interaction in both a passive and active sense, right? When you're coming at it from a competitive viewpoint. Right? And that so that's when you're going against other people. And it's the same way for when it's on your team. You need to know whether people are want to be aggressive, whether they want to be passive, whether they want to be defensive, right? Everyone enjoys Amp Card and the battle games in a different way. And you want to make sure that you are utilizing the highest capability that they are uh, to the highest that they are capable. And by doing that is by doing what they want, right? So that they have that buy-in like I spoke to before. And um, on, I find that when someone's on your team, it's easier to build and review your player profile because you're typically all geared towards, you're all working towards the same goal. Right? So people are more open on who they are. They're not as guarded um, about their strategies and ideas. And, and so you use, you use that empathy for um, this person who's typically a defensive player and they want to be more aggressive. You go, okay. And you just be like, okay, this person doesn't have, the, doesn't have as big as a toolkit as what some other aggressive players do. So as a team leader, you got to make sure that that toolkit is supported and their aggressiveness, right? However, however it is, because every situation is unique. If this person wants to be aggressive, let them be aggressive, support them in being aggressive. If they get tired of it, support that choice as well, right? And you want to review that. If you notice someone wanting to get more and more aggressive, right? They're working towards something and you need to put that in your player, player profile because they're going to develop those tools um, over time, and they're gonna. If you're not paying attention, they're gonna catch you off guard. With it. Um. So, um. Um. So, when you've built up your pattern recognition, 
And by build up, I mean that you just, you start noticing certain patterns out of people, right? One of them is, oh, Kendall's going to drop his shield whenever someone draws a bow on him, right? Every time, Kendall's going to drop his shield because he's just scared of pinning it, right? That's when you are, al- that's when it allows you to make a call because then you can go and you can be like, hey, Admiral, can you just draw on Kendall uh, with a pinning arrow and just call it pinning arrow? He's going to throw a shield down and then he's only, and then he's going to lose his shield until he goes and picks it up again. Maybe I can pick him off with, um, pick him off with an abeyance. I can pick him off with a, a force bolt. I can pick him off with another arrow. I can go at him. Uh, dual wield or with my own shield right and you won't be able to get around my shield right you're able to make once you realize that i have this pattern that i do every time you're able to exploit it right um and also in when you're that's like building up a plan and making a call when you're on the line or you're fighting right i like i like making calls when there is a kill or when we have edged the opponent line and by edging the opponent line they like here's you edge and you kind of gotten both flanks so it's easier to come in and fold in that's when i like to call for a push or i go now or however it is right um just basically when the team is oriented in the bad position or if there's a kill like in the center then that's when i like to like do a critical moment and burst in and try and do as much damage, right? Um, so because there's an exciting incident and if for people that I know are aggressive or defensive, people at that ex- uh, exciting point, they'll fall back into those default those default roles because you either want to be an aggressive person or you're defensive and that goes really deeper down unless you're truly working on stuff. And so that's when I like making my calls. But the thing is, is that I, like, oh, one thing that I'm not sure if a lot of people know is that I don't like making calls. I like receiving calls. Um, and it's, that's just because part of it, probably if I look deeper and I talk to a therapist about it, it's just, I'm afraid of being blamed for the wrong call. Even though it's a make-believe game, right, I'm just, very i'm deep down i'm scared of being blamed for i'm afraid of being blamed for losing that right um and so that's why i like receiving calls because if someone makes a call i will try my hardest to fulfill it because that's the plan that's what we're doing that's what we want to do right but if it fails then it was my fault right i'm not going to blame the other person for it because they tried something right and so but the thing is it's not my fault because i didn't make that call right um and that's to be like it's okay to feel overwhelmed and scared but you owe it to yourself to try to make those calls right if there's no team leader then that's when i typically try to step in and i try to um fulfill that leader position but if i see someone else that is more capable or wants to do it um wants to do it then i typically let them because i want to be a facilitator and not the leader but yeah, um, so yeah, that'll, so going over pattern recognition, um, you develop it by having empathy for people and by getting um, people's input um, of those that you're trying to understand and have empathy for, and also by reviewing. Reviewing is big. Reviewing helps you in almost every aspect of life is just being honest with yourself. And not blaming yourself, just being like, why did that, why did that, why did that work? Oh, because we're great. Sometimes it is just skill. Oh, we were just better skilled. And if we tried that against better skilled people, it would have failed. Like, yeah, that's fine. You won because you were great. Sometimes it's like, why did that work? Oh, because they actually lost it. because they made a mistake. Not that you won it. They lost it, right? And you got to be honest with yourself about the review. Um. And yeah, pattern recognition feeds right into making calls, right? Um, And that allows us to jump into the next point of making calls and reacting. Um, This was another one that people uh, asked a lot for. And so like, when you're making a call, you want it to be loud and you want it to be short. 
like calling out left, here, push, right? Little short words that carry a lot of information, right? When someone calls left, that gets everyone's attention to what they believe is left. Some people um, don't understand what left and right is, and that's fine, right? That's just something that you got to work on. Um, but like, you want to make sure that you're carrying out as much information, short a time, and, and as clear a word as possible. So when someone, when we're in a line and someone wants confirmation about something, I don't say right, I say correct, right? <laughs> so you want to make sure that you are portraying this information clear way as possible to make sure that people understand you so you don't have to so they don't have to do a lot of mental uh mental checkpoints to see where you're coming from and to act upon right um i like i like using push i learned it from nick um push is a, i find a really good indicator because you're just you're moving in to take space Attack means that you should be swinging your sword, right? Uh, or firing an arrow or thrusting with a spear, something along those lines, right? But push means take up space because if someone is afraid of attacking, they can still move forward. Your board's people can still move forward even if they have lost an arm because you are pushing forward, right? It helps put that in, <laughs> um, it helps put that in their minds and they're just supposed to take up space to help you win. Um, now receiving calls is that you are, you listen to the call, not the person making it, right. You don't want to look at the person making it right. Cause you want your attention on the actual objective that you're trying to achieve. So if you look for confirmation, right you're it's it's taken away if you can't hear them just say what or again or you call out their name like you're trying you're wanting confirmation and you need confirmation from them so but you don't want to take your eyes off if there's a really big disturbance in communication you need to disengage and look over to try and figure out what's happening sometimes it's letting someone else take your place in line so you're actually looking at what they want to do and then oh okay they want me to do that and then you're going in right a lot of human communication is built up in body language and everything that's why you want to keep the words very short right but um you want to make sure that you don't take your eyes off the goal that you are actually pushing um and taking and doing what you're supposed to do and sometimes if you don't understand what they're doing but it calls for you to make calls for you to act on the call take a guess right take a guess right if someone calls push and they meant push back as in take a step back but you push forward right no one's gonna blame you on that one that was just a bad call on their part um so you want to listen to the call not the person making it and also that means that you're, if someone else is making the call, you're reacting to their call because that person is making a call and probably acting on it and you want to support that person. And I say this in a bunch of classes, the worst thing is make a call, do an action and then be left out alone. You're just You're going to get skewered, spelled out, verbaled out every time and it's just going to fizzle out and that, that team has now lost one person, right? So if you hear push, push. If it was the wrong time to push, that can be decided afterward, right, during your death count. And you ask, hey, why did, why did you call push there, right? And then, oh, I thought it was a good opportunity. Like, oh, okay, it was a mistake. All right, right? It was, oh, I was under pressure and I needed, I needed to, and I needed help. Be like, okay, and you build up your payer profile that this person's going to call push when they're under pressure. So maybe that person needs a defender with them so they're not making those calls because they're doing it maybe at the wrong time. Or they need a defender there so that they can properly make calls, right? And learn how to make them. Um, when you are receiving a call, you want to give um, confirmation 
um, confirmation that you've received it, um, if you have breath. So um, I know Nathan uses seen um, as both that he understands and sees what the objective is and also confirmation to know that the plan is happening. I like to use K or ya, right? Short, brief, um, and you can repeat it really quickly, right? Um, and that just lets the person know. If you're out of breath, try to give a thumbs up, um, a fist in the air, um, a, a nod, right? Um, but if you're doing that nonverbal, you want it to be exaggerated. So you want it to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you want to do yes, yes, yes. Or big nods like that, right? Various things, but you want it to be exaggerated so that the person viewing you and making the, in the call, even if it's peripheral, can see it happening. Um, making calls, making calls is hard. Um, well, I find it hard on when to make the call um i spoke before about how i i like receiving them and i also said that i like making them when there is an inciting incident um someone dies um i see that we have the, the flanks right um i like making calls at that point but other people it's really it comes down to a gut feeling about when you think something should be had or a big one is a call that everyone should be making all the time is when you die. Call dead. That that is a call. Um, there's something to be said about calling out dead, 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 to try and get someone's attention on a objective. That I think is skirting the rules, and I think that is not um that is not with the spirit of the rules, right? But calling out dead loud and proud, let someone know that your side has at least lost one person has maybe failed at the objective there's a flank coming right you have to like try to make those up um and then making calls for when attacking or when to stop an attack that is having a view that is outside of what is directly in front of you if you notice so yeah like i said if i notice that we have um the flanks right i'll call it and if it's a ditch match, all we need to do is just win the ditch and then we've won that match, right? It doesn't matter if we've won it by one person or by five people, right? That's the point. If I die in that push, as long as we win, then it was worth it, right? In the ditch. In other games and everything, it has other... You don't want to do that when you have... You can only revive when all your team has died, like in a lot of company battles, because then you want to make sure the odds are more in your favor, right? But making those calls, it comes down to a gut feeling most of the time and having a view that is outside of what is directly in front of you. Now, that's hard because you want, if you have a pole coming at you, you want to defend the pole. You have a sword coming at you. You got an arrow that you have to put the shield for, right? It's building up that peripheral vision and understanding and knowing who's on the sides and where they are. So yeah, making calls is just a skill that you need to build up and understand and learn from and you're going to learn by failing if every call you make is perfect i would definitely check to see if the spoons are real right because that means that you're in a simulation and someone's trying to get or you've been incepted maybe maybe that's it there's a lot of movies that it could be if every single plan you come up with works right um but yeah so um making calls and reacting so when you're receiving calls you want to listen to the call and not the person you want to still act on the call right because it means that someone else isn't and if the whole team acts on a call at least something is going to happen right um it may not be the best thing but it's it's at least something right because if just one person goes then you've lost you've you you've lost that person on your right um and then you can review afterwards because that's the best thing about amp guard is that as long as people are checking their arrows on the regular you just come back alive after like 60 or 60 seconds or five minutes or just after a re um and then making calls you want to make it loud but you want to make it short um preferably one 
I would say maximum two syllable words. Um, something that's very clear for the people to take in and process, right? So that they can act just as quick as they're um, doing it. Um, oh, I forgot. Uh, Nonverbal making calls. Uh, that has a lot to do with playing with people for a long, long time um, and getting that body language down. Um, if someone's outside of the viewpoint, you want to make sure that there is a point of physical contact. For And I use this in a lot of um, the broadcasts that I do. Um, Nick will grab my shoulder, um, part of my jersey, and drag me for where um, he wants me, right? I don't see that as bossy or aggressive, um, even though it is forceful, but it's forceful for a reason, is that he wants to make sure that I am feeling and understanding where he wants. So he will grab and he will pull and then he will press. I want you here, right? Um, and that's so I understand where he wants me to be, the pole arm, in order to help me help him with the shield because that is my job. And we have an understanding because we are a team that I have my job as a board person and he has his uh, job as the pole arm, right? So nonverbal communication. Com uh, communication. Um, if you want to do it without contact and nonverbal, it takes a lot of time to develop and understand that, and you need to know the person. I developed pretty good nonverbal communication with a bunch of defensemen when I was playing hockey. Um, with one in particular, Ross, just because we had played, I think we played four years together by the time that we just stopped. Well, I think I moved on to a house league and he just moved away but we were on the same team for a long time in the same position. And we just worked really well together because we had that time. It wasn't because either of us were particularly good and we didn't even hang out outside of hockey. It's just that we played with each other for a long time. We practiced with each other. We practiced with each other probably for two, maybe three days a week during the winter months. And we had played two games a week during the winter months. And then in the summer, we let that follow, but then we picked it up again during tryouts. And yeah, we just, that's why we were good with each other because we had a lot of experience. So you need to build that up and then through nonverbal but physical contact, you need to be understandable. And if you're doing the call and you're being forceful and stuff, you got to get consent from the person to touch them. Be like, hey, do you mind if I take you and put you where I want? And also, if you're being forceful with someone, you got to make sure you come up with that aftercare and you congratulate them on doing things. Right, be like, oh man, thank you so much for uh for showing up there. Right, you gotta have that aftercare because if someone's if being forceful, those they could be taken on in a bad light. Right, um, if you don't have that built up trust, even if you have consent, which you should always have whenever you're touching someone, right, but. Make sure that you have that aftercare there and your understanding. And let them know, be like, listen, if I'm being too forceful, you can you please let me know so I can stop it? Um, and so, yeah, making calls can be from a small team where you have like five to, I would say a maximum of a small team is like 15 people. And even then, that's kind of a big team. You should be breaking up into different squads at that point. Um, but like you can make calls as a big team leader where you're like, okay, now this team goes, right? And it's that's harder <laughs> because you don't have you, you need intel to do that. But yeah, um that lets us go on to uh how to do teamwork in a large team. So a large team has a lot of moving pieces in it. Not only is it a lot of people going and working within each other, but it's the other team. It's the environment that you're in. It could be the weather, like if it's windy or if it's too sunny or if it's rainy, right? Um, but you need to you need to understand that there are a lot of moving pieces and can't control the moving pieces. And only point them at what the collective goal should be and what their smaller objectives are, right? You wind them up and then you let them go. This isn't command and conquer. 
or whatever RTS that the youths are playing nowadays. I'm pretty sure no one plays RTS anymore. It's now on to MOBAs. Right? Um, but you, the goal, if you're being a, trying to be a leader, or even just a part, I guess, yeah, even as a participant, you understand that the move, that the, all the pieces are going to get cranked up and then they're all going to get let go, maybe at different times, but they're going to get let go and you can't worry about the other pieces. You got to worry about your piece and your goal uh, and your objective towards the bigger goal, right? So um, whether you're leading or not, um, before start during a large battle game, right? Um, when everyone's mustering around, um, either going on putting on their team straps or going and stealing team straps and giving them out to friends so that they all play on the same team, um, ruining the balance of the game, right? At that time when people are going around and seeing who, you want to go around and see who is on your team and interact with them. This is for two main reasons. It's for morale, and it's for inventory, right? So morale is that you want to get buy-in, and to get buy-in, you need your morale to get high. And people need to feel that you are buying into them, right? So um, having high morale isn't being that peppy person going around being like, yeah, 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 yeah. Some, that works for people, right? That works for people. Other times, if some people do that, they're going to turn people off right? It all depends on the type of person that you are, right? If someone came in, saw me, and I was being all peppy and whatnot, they'd probably be like, what, who gave what to Kendall, right? Um, but if I'm being very jovial, I'm like, ah, oh, 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 right? That's more how I think people see me, and so they'd be, be like, oh, Kendall's pumped to be, to be on this team, right? Um, and I understand that sometimes if you're looking around and you're doing inventory about who's on your team and you go, and then you look at the other team and you do inventory there, you go, huh, fuck, <laughs> right? It's hard to keep up morale. I get it. I've been there. But the thing is that you have to, you have to try. You have to try because maybe the other team, maybe their morale is weaker than yours, right? Um, but um, you want to get people to buy into the team and you get that by believing in them and them feeling it right so you go and you be like, oh man you're playing druid i love you playing druid awesome you see someone like um who's playing here like oh i got i got dibs on at least one of your protections versus magic i got dibs on that you, you, owe, you owe me that right and then you, you laugh about it right you call out what they're doing and you let them know that you see them and you understand what they want to do. And that comes from before with your pattern recognition and all that. Or you can be like, oh, what are you doing in Druid today? Oh, that's awesome. Okay, I can't wait to fight with you, right? But if they're going Avatar, right? If they're going for uh, Candy Druid, you go and you be like, oh, awesome. I can't wait to see you juicing people up. We're going to be, if you're on our team, we're going to be so, we're going to be set. We got no worries for enchantments, right? Um, And also, it's good to interact with people by um, touching, hugging, and high-fiving, right? Um, high-fiving is usually pretty good because if you put up a high-five, that is you asking for consent, and then them giving, you are both giving and asking for consent in, in a good way. Same thing with a fist. If you've built up a relationship where you know that they are okay with you hugging them, that's awesome. Give them a hug, right? Lift them up, ba 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 ba, right? All those fun things. Just make sure you have consent before asking when you're touching them. Um, and then ask them what they're running. Be interested in what they're doing, right? Ask them what they're interested in doing and pump them up when doing it because you are building up that morale and you're getting them excited to be on your team. And when we're on a team together, we're feeling that excitement. We have the buy-in. We're going to work together. If you go in and someone who usually goes candy drew is saying, oh, I'm running Avatar. You're like, oh, really? You're running Avatar? That person's going to go, oh, great i have this dick on my team i can't wait to fight with them right don't be that person no one likes that person if you're that person stop be a different person change who you are um so that's morale you want to get that buy-in and you want the people to believe in you and the way that they believe in you is by believing in them and it's a technically a negative feedback loop but it's in a positive direction so 
Yeah. Um, inventory. So this, you want an inventory of just a general how much of which class. I find that very hard to do. Um, I prefer more to go on just a general of the level of skill that certain teams have, right? Some people are really good at going. They have the, their their magic is strong. Uh, for instance, Justin. Justin is really good at breaking down um, how much magic uh, melee um, support. Really good at that, right? He can break that down really quickly and be um, and get that to you in a very consensed way. Um, me, I, you, I I find that hard to do, so I go more of how skilled or um yeah how skilled people are and kind of go from there um you also kind of want to know like the kinds of people on your team and that comes from your pattern recognition we have a lot of defenders um we have a lot of aggressive people right also who are our runners we need runners to get intel back and forth right and that's not just oh who's in really good shape and can run right who are the people that like to run <laughs> right who are the people that like to run around and do this thing right those are the people that you want to get in there so you want to know your runners your aggressors your defenders your hotheads your homebodies right all those different types of people who are on your team so you can get an inventory of what types of strategies are going to work with you if you have a lot of homebodies you got to you, you got to think of a of a quick but defensive way to start securing points if you have a lot of uh, aggressors you got to think of ways to make sure that you are always that the defense is never at home base the fight's always elsewhere type of deal right and when you're doing this you also want to get kind of a sense of who the leaders are going to be within this right um if for instance, uh, and this is going to come up uh, later, um, if I see Chase is on my team, I'm going to see and kind of look, and maybe I'll ask him outright, see how he's feeling. Maybe I'll just try and read his body language and how he's acting if he wants to be a leader that day, if he wants to be the general, right? And if he is, I'll be a lieutenant or a sergeant under him because that's, that's the position I like to be. If I see that we don't have a lot of natural leaders, there because not everyone is naturally everyone can be a leader not everyone has a natural affinity i might see if maybe that's my job for the day is to step up into that position, right but you want to and then if that is i want to see who i can rely on be the sergeants and lieutenants right so you want to see um so for inventory you want to see kind of the class layout general class and the general skill layout um, also, how much armor you have, especially in V8, that's a huge thing, right? How much armor you have. You want to see the different types of people so that you know which types of roles that you're dealing with. So you can start getting the, getting the strategy fluids bubbling and churning, right? Um, and you also want to know who your sergeants are going to be. Um, and go from there and all, or just who the leaders are. And so when everyone's sashed up, the, the rules are in, you're, you're, at, uh, you're going to the base, you want to come up, you want to gather up the trusted, uh, the sergeants, the leaders, and all that stuff, and you want to come up with a plan. Uh, you want to, remember, uh, kiss, you want to keep it simple, stupid, right? Come up with a, just a really, really brief plan. We are going to go take center rock. We are going to take the um, main trail, right? Certain things like that, right? Um, you want to make sure that your sergeants understand, uh, well, sorry, the sergeants need to know what their plans, what the plan is and what their, what their job is going to be, right? Uh, now, after really briefly, brief, brief plan is, uh, made up um you want to get the team's attention um right you want to get them pumped um you want to get them pumped up and briefly explain the objectives 
hold this, push that. We're going to keep reserves here, right? Um, and also, um, who wants to be the base team? You want to make sure that the base team is kind of taken care of so that those people or ha aren't feeling left out when you start assigning jobs. Because those people who want to be at the base, they are front and center. Yes, I am the base. I will be here. Awesome. I already have my job. This is what I'm going to do, right? And then you start assigning the objectives to the sergeant, right? Um, so, for instance, you go, um, Kendall, you're going to take center rock. And I go, yep. And then you say, who wants to go with Kendall? Take the people that want to go with Kendall, right? And you bring them off to the side. So now Kendall can start giving out the sub jobs to people. Right. And finding out who building up their own strategy there. Right. Um, when all the teams have been assigned, right. All the sergeants have their, have their crews, right. You, <clears throat> um, you go and you start, um, sorry, I missed. When all the teams have been assigned, ask who hasn't been assigned, assigned and ask them just what they want to do. It should be a quick mock mop up if they don't know what they want to do sometimes they can just be a floater going around right um you do a quick recap with asking the sergeants what their jobs are be like kind what is your team doing rachel what are was your team frank melissa right and they should all you should have like maybe four people just doing out a quick recap of what their jobs are right and then if you're a team leader you join a team yourself Right? Or maybe you're a runner, right? Who knows? Right? So that which I just described, so getting the team pumped. Um, so sorry. Um, starting off doing an inventory, getting your trusted together, um, getting a plan together, getting the team pumped, assigning objectives and teams to objectives, right? Um, cleaning up anyone that hasn't been assigned, getting it and getting a recap. I call that the chase method because I saw him do that um, two years, not in a row. And it worked spectacular, spectacular. So, um, so um, the first year where I saw chase do that, that's when uh, Valiant stand where it was snail base. Right. That was the first year that that was up. <laughs> that was the first year that was up and it worked awesome mind you we had a really good base but still everyone was bought into the plan we knew our plan and it worked right um even outside outside of snail base right next year i wasn't on chase's team i looked around no one was taking leadership so i said all right i'll take i'll take the leadership and i went up i tried to get people pumped and I tried to get teams assigned, but the thing is, steps I missed was that we didn't get people together to come up with a plan before. So while I'm up trying to get people assigned, I'm also coming in with my plan. So now I'm doing two jobs at the exact same time, and people are either distracted or not buying into the plan. They got other stuff doing going on, right? Um. And then when we go out, people don't know what the plan is, right? Because we, the, I, didn't, I didn't do a recap, right? And through the excitement, people forgot what their plans are. They didn't have backup plans because they were coming up with one on the spot, right? And so you really got to make sure that, like, you get the trusted, uh, I call it the trusted, but maybe there's a better term for it, where the sergeants, lieutenants in general, have them come together, come up with a base plan, have them recap, and that way everyone knows it's all on the same page, right? And then, uh, and then you just got to make sure that people have that buy-in because when I came up with my plan, no one had a buy-in. I barely had buy-in to my own plan because I was coming up with it on the spot and asking for volunteers for who's going to be sergeant, right? You need to make sure that you're getting out there before and getting those sergeants and movements and who's going to be the leader beforehand and getting those assignments done after the fact. Um, 
And then through the game, um, you are always gathering information and what's happening out there and what's not. Um, during the break, check in to see what resources are available, how many refreshes people have and everything, um, and how they're feeling, both in mechanical and a physical sense. Because those long, big battle games, those are physically draining. You need to know whether your warriors are literally just, they're getting exhausted because they're sick and tired of moving around in armor, right? Um, and just the mechanical resources, like how many, how many fingers of death someone has, right? Um, if the archers are losing their arrows, right? There's all, there's all that stuff that you have to account for and plan accordingly. Um, you have to uh, give information to your team. Um, give information to your team and don't gossip. Be like, I think they're planning on going left, right? You need to make sure like there's a possibility that they're going left. You need a small team out there just to collect information or to stop them, right? You need to keep pumping your people up. Um, that's during the game. You want to ask information. You want to always gather information. That's from runners. When you're dead, ask people what's going on. Be like, hey, what's going on on the left flank? Right? And you want to make sure that you're kind of out of your shot of the other team, but you do what you can in your death base. Right? Um, so you want to always gather information. You want to keep track of the resources, both mechanically and physically. And you want to give information to your team but make sure it's not gossip because if all the information is up in your head, it's not helping anyone. Because if you give out information, someone can it could be wrong information and someone can contradict it. And that that's how you get things fixed, is by getting information confirmed. Um and then you also want to keep keep uh pumping your people up. Sometimes if you're having a hard time uh keeping your own morale up, right? It's maybe you, you gotta go go to a friend and be like, listen, I, I need Get the rain because I'm feeling not a spoon, right? I'm getting frustrated, right? Sometimes you're getting frustrated, you just need to switch classes. Um, that's happened for two of my uh, of the bodies that I went. I just had to switch classes because the class I was playing with was not driving with the rules of the game, and I just had to switch it up. and I enjoyed myself much better, and I was able to have the help morale way. Um, and then after the game, after the game is very important. Whether you've won or lost, you want to congratulate your team as well as the other team, and you want to do it humbly. You want to give highlights of things that you saw out there to other people of what they, of what they were doing, not your own. Don't want to brag, right? You want to highlight what other people are doing, and you also want to ask them for highlights. Ask them for highlights of yourself. If someone asks you for a highlight of yourself, give it. Because that means that they're interested in it and they've asked you to tell it. Right? Um, but you want to make sure that are making sure that morale is high as it coming out. Now, if you're the winning team, don't get talking to the losing team, right? Saying, hey, that was a great game sometimes isn't the best be like you fought really good today right that might be depending on how you say it, a little condescending right but you want to say listen you had me on the rope a couple times during that match it was really stressful fighting you and you want to be sincere about this stuff to make sure that you're not being condescending to the people that you're that you're trying to talk to. um and yeah after the game after the game um if you if you've been a leader or even doing active teamwork by the stuff I've been describing, um, you're going to want to take a break. You're probably physically tired. You're probably dehydrated, right? You need to relax. You're probably mentally spent if you can actively try and keep morale up, fighting off your own frustration, right? Um, you just need to relax. And this is not the time to do a proper review. You can think back on things, but especially after a long, big battle game, this is not the time to review. Everything is too fresh, and you are not in the right mindset to do a review. 
Um, you, you do it later when you're actually hydrated and fed. Um, you see if um, you can get another person to do the review um, with you, preferably a leader um, from the other team, so that you can get both sides of the coin. But talking to people on your team where just to get another viewpoint on how the battle game right is good. Um, sometimes you lost because like you were you were just going to lose sometime, right? Regardless of the strategy. And yeah, sometimes you won just because you were gonna win, regardless of your strategy. Right? There was one it was in Linagon, I forget what it was. I was put on a team and I did take a leadership role on it and I had the sergeants and I built I built up the teams and at game start we went out there and we completely crushed the other team. Completely crushed the other team. Right? And that's and one was because people did the jobs that I that took the objectives that I said, listen, can your team take this? Can your team take that? But the thing is, and then it was such a crushing that I was switched over to the other team. And let me tell you what, regardless of whatever plan I came up with, my team was going to win because my team, my original team was stacked. It was completely stacked. It was so hard to fight against that team. So hard, right? And it was, yeah, so like that was not on me because regardless of whatever strategy I came up with, it was going to succeed. Uh, right? Even if it was a defensive one where it was just like, listen, let's just let them wash up against against us and then we'll just take the we'll just take the field after. I was gonna So yeah, just just got a review. So um yeah, it's my final minutes. Um that was it for teamwork. Hopefully it got to what people wanted to be spoken about. Um uh, teamwork is just such a general topic. Uh, I tried to catch as much as possible from the questions, um, but I just really want to give a big, big thanks to uh, the Admiral and Munjo for putting this together, the Admiral for her organizational skills and her drive to get this done. We have so many out of kingdom uh, panelists and lecturers. It was such a good way to take advantage of the format that we've been forced and also, it's always good to get more than just my dumb face speaking up on how to be a warrior or barbarian. And now, hopefully, we'll get other people to talk about how to perform, to you, right? Um, and big thanks to Wunjo with his techno magic skills, um, with us both wrestling with tech savvy. Um, on one end, I'm on mobile data right now. I don't know if that was better, <laughs> right? Um, I got two mulligans, so I'm not sure if I own for the second mulligan. I need to own the second skeleton. I don't know. He already owns one of mine. Uh, but yeah, huge thanks to the both of them. To the others that were behind the scenes working, thank you. I don't know what you did, but without you, Ampguard would suck a lot. You are the backbone few people recognize and understand. But I see you. I appreciate you. And thank you very much for everything you do for this wonderful community magnificent hobby that we have so yeah i like those to be my last word we'll get waved out all right thank you so much jeet for those kind words um we, we <laughs> you are off screen you can stop waving right now um <laughs> <laughs> um before uh we'll, we'll talk to you privately in a second that being said i'm just gonna outro you to the audience here we have one more presentation coming up at nine o'clock we have the mental and physical health on the battlefield class with admiral so we're gonna take a lot of what uh, the folks have already been talking about you've heard little bits and pieces of this um, but it's going to come to a head here with this very, very interesting and intriguing class that is useful no matter what your preferred style of play is. So, please stand by. We are going to get the Admiral set up, and we will be back at 9 o'clock for this final lecture of the day. Please make sure to sign in on the Nine Blades Discord if you haven't already, and check out the silent auction on the Nine Blades Facebook group. We'll be back at 9.